Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Really excited for this evening. Um, we've been making our way through this incredible book, this text, The True Source of Healing by Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. If you've never heard of this book, no problem. But one of the aspects of this book that's so compelling is the invitation to find resource through the natural elements of the world. So we've been making our way week by week with earth, fire, water, wind, and we've made it to space. And I just, you know, everything goes better with space. It's such a beautiful quality to explore and to be able to kind of call from. In some ways, it's the larger quality from which everything else can arise. And so it's a, uh, yeah, it's been really fun thinking about how we can explore this quality of space together. I mean, very often here for folks who come on a regular basis, we talk about space. It's a really tricky topic to talk about well, because it is not, not only invisible and intangible, but it can be pretty confusing how to identify, especially the relationship between space and awareness. So we'll kind of talk about that a bit more, just to try to give us a bit of a sense of how we can harness both qualities. Because the spaciousness is a really wonderful way for us to hold and host difficulties in our life. It's a way to feel a presence in the body that's beyond just the physical and form body. But awareness, it's like the light. It's the illumination within the space. Space on its own could be a little bit dull, soggy, enjoyable, but not exactly that kind of brightness that we're really seeking. So we're gonna do the space element, but before we do so, I want us to revisit the kind of foundation practices that have been taught through, through this text. And that is these, what are called three precious pills. And this is an invitation for us to settle our body, our speech, and our mind into natural states of being. And they seem a bit counterintuitive, especially the first time you hear them, this idea that the natural state of our body, we might, like, what, what might you guess is the natural state of your body? Tired, hungry, busy, right? relaxed, I know, but you're, you're advanced. <laughs> Yeah, but really the, the natural state that he describes so beautifully is stillness, that actually our body in its natural state is still. And we'll, I'll do a little reading from one of his descriptions, but just that as an invitation is, is so interesting, and especially the quality of what stillness can offer. So when he describes stillness, he says it's just this really unique refuge for us. Each of these precious pills has its own, um, in a way, refuge or way for us to feel the abundance. And the refuge of stillness, he says, is unbounded sacred space. And we can really notice that as we settle into the body and we settle into the body. What we discover is that actually there's a lot of movement in the body that is still. There's a lot of actual expansion within the body that is still. The second of these precious pills is when we settle our speech into its natural state. So that means kind of the inner dialogue. Often, you know, we're narrating our experience. We're not just experiencing food or conversation or walking through the streets or biking. We have a whole other layer, right? This kind of inner narration. So what do we think is the natural state of our inner speech most of the time? Yeah, negativity, judgment, right? Self-critical, other critical. And his invitation here to us is to find that the natural state of our inner speech is silence. And not like, you be quiet, you know, don't talk but that there is actually this refuge of silence that's always already within us. And when we had the good fortune of him joining us a couple of weeks back, 
I love the way he described, it may not seem that it's so quiet in here, but compared to out there, right? Compared to all the news media and the conversations, and it's actually, we can find the silence within us. And there's such a refuge there. And he says that that can start touching into this refuge of infinite awareness. So we imagine, you know, possibly turning down the dial of this ongoing inner speech. We might not get fully rid of it. And then having this sense of more spacious or infinite awareness. And then this last quality of settling the mind in its natural state, this third precious pill. It's a little difficult sometimes to disentangle speech and mind, but there's really only one aspect of um, mind. You know, speech is only just one aspect of mind. A lot else happens in our mind. There's imagination, there's visualization, um, just so much content that can occur in the mind. Our fantasies, our imaginations, our planning, just a lot that is happening in formation. And he says that this, this mind, this unbelievably powerful and beautiful um, sense organ that we have, that it's natural state. And he, I know a lot of people in the room know, but what, what would you guess is your mind's natural state usually? Busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, flowing. And I really love this because the idea of settling body, speech, and mind, as many of you know, is very classic in, in Buddhist teachings. It's often kind of done quickly, a preliminary. Settle your body, speech, and mind. Okay, now let's breathe. Then we'll go on to our practice. But often the way that it's described when we settle our mind is a bit more about this vastness, which is wonderful, kind of an idea of vastness or openness. But he calls it the refuge of genuine warmth so that the mind, right? And he would point here to the heart that the mind is not only spacious, that by nature and its quality, there's warmth. It's very encouraging. And for those of you who may have had the opportunity to sit in retreat or even in a meditation where you settled in, sometimes we can miss that there is this quality, there's this low level of warmth, maybe even joy. That's a fundamental aspect of our mind when it's settled, not when it's agitated, right? Not when we're frustrated or disappointed or longing, but that there is a warmth. And I think the power of these three precious pills is it's like shifting. One of my great teachers, Alan Wallace, used this metaphor that when we really commit to the practice, when we take refuge in the practice, meaning we decide, yeah, settling my body, speech, and mind is the place where I'm going to find safety and liberation. That it's kind of like a little small town switching from coal power to solar power. And you can imagine if you're relying on coal, there's a lot of kind of particulate in the air. There's, you know, almost like a dust cloud over the entire town. And so they decide to go solar. There's no it's actually hard to find the light that comes through to energize the town. There's like a transition place in between. So maybe we've started to, you know, stop seeking our refuge or our sense of safety out there. Like maybe it isn't um, what I can achieve on the outside. Maybe it isn't keeping myself fully occupied with all the amazing things in this city I could do at all times. Maybe the refuge is here there can be like a little lag, right? Like how, we still have that whole cloud over us. But as we start to drop into practice and maybe if we're fortunate, even in the first couple of times, that inner light does show up. We do start to feel that there's a refuge that's internal. And it's such a confirming and beautiful sign, a way to feel a little sense of confidence. And it's not just me finding ways to import goodness from out there and here, there is always already a natural sense of our basic goodness. I think that's such an encouraging message. So we're going to practice with these three precious pills. And I'd like us to spend a moment before we do so, really touching into bodhicitta, 
Um, for some folks, that word might be quite familiar. Uh, it's the awakened heart. And bodhicitta, it's not only an attitude um, or an emotion or a feeling. Bodhicitta is this very clear commitment to wake up for the sake of all beings. And that sounds pretty good, right? Wouldn't we love to be more free and then free others? But there's actually kind of a little challenge within it, meaning we have to believe that we can wake up or else it's a little bit of a fantasy that doesn't have real roots in it. So I'd like to invite us <clears throat> to consider the outrageous possibility that all of us could wake up in this lifetime and that in so doing, we will be able to support so many beings. And that is why we practice. Because that's it. Bodhicitta is the whole practice. Like everything else supports bodhicitta. And um, yeah, it can, it kind of came up for me the other day, just that kind of squeeze of the heart of the suffering of this world. And that it never feels like there's enough we can do. Don't know if anybody else relates to that. And it, I recognize that I, I wasn't really committed to my bodhicitta. I wasn't really believing that I could possibly wake up for the sake of all beings. And it's not just when I reach this destination of waking up, I'll be able to help others. Like I see that the path of bodhicitta, I'm already more available. Like orienting my commitments towards this path absolutely helps me be on a day-to-day -day basis in the smallest ways and in the biggest ways. You know, that's my directionality. You can think of bodhicitta almost like your guiding light in your compass. So I will invite us to um, arouse bodhicitta, but I wanted to, you know, to say a couple words on it. And it is indeed a feeling and emotion. It's emotional to think of bodhicitta, but it's so much more than just a feeling or emotion. It really should be this, um, this yearning in the heart. You know, yearning for living in a world in which compassion is how we all engage. And that would be a one in which suffering wouldn't be absent, but suffering would actually be met. Much different than, unfortunately, the world we live in right now, most of the time. So with that, we'll do a, a first practice, probably a bit on the shorter side have a little discussion, talk about space, and do one more practice. And um, for those, I see some folks, maybe unfamiliar faces. This is the Dharma Collective. You're so welcome here. We got Jimmy at the door. So you can relax and feel at ease. We can completely um, make yourself comfortable. We got seats in the front, if that is more comfortable for you. And yeah, it's important, I think, especially when it's your first time somewhere, to just feel welcomed. And this is a volunteer run community. So it exists out of generosity. And I'm extremely biased, but I think it's a very beautiful, loving community. So for all folks who it's your first time or not, we love you, welcome. Thank you for being here. Each and every person who is here is an accelerant for our work. So it's such an act of generosity to be here. So thank you all. And uh, yeah, you can definitely um, make yourself comfortable. And also it's great if you can find a posture that supports not only your body in being comfortable, but supports a sense of the dignity of posture. We just talked about bodhicitta, like what an amazing aspiration, an amazing intention. See if the body can hold that kind of posture So feeling the uprightness of the spine, the softness in the face, especially around the eyes. Feel and imagine a sense of ease and relaxation around the chest and the heart. 
Maybe the shoulders want to just slightly come back so that the heart can be tilting upwards. And finding a place where the palms can either rest on the knees and the earth pressing posture or fold it in the lap. Whatever is easier on the neck and shoulders. I'm taking what could be the first intentional breath of the day, really following the breath with your attention. to help settle the mind and settle ourselves here together. We can follow the breath and do a simple practice of counting. So as we inhale silently to ourselves, we say a number at the top of the inhale and then exhale. So trying out 11 breaths of counting. And if you find yourself carried away and distracted, no problem, just starting back at one. It doesn't matter how far you get. The purpose is to just bring the mind and breath and body together. Couple more moments here, a couple more breaths to engage with the counting. And as much as possible, as you breathe in, you're just noticing breathing in, not focusing on counting. Then you make this simple notation. And as you breathe out, completely release the number, just focusing on the breath. Just a little punctuation between the breath to help settle the mind. And if the mind is really busy and keeps getting distracted, no problem. See how kind and gentle you can be as you relax and release and return to following the breath.
and then gently release the counting for a couple more moments. Continue to let your attention ride the breath as though it were a rider on the horse. So closely following the sensations of the rise and fall. Gently shifting the attention and awareness to the body. And for just a moment or two, noticing what are the sensations in the body? Are there areas of warmth or tightness, areas that feel at ease, maybe movement, other forms of energy? Just allow your attention and awareness to really explore and be curious about this body and this moment. And with an embodied sense of presence and awareness, we invite this aspiration, if it feels comfortable, of bodhicitta. Considering the possibility that each and every being can awaken in this lifetime and be free not from all pain, but be free from the suffering that gets added onto the pain. with the possibility that all beings could awaken and have that freedom in this lifetime. We are among them. So considering this aspiration and intention to work towards that kind of awakening in order to serve all beings. It can be helpful to really recognize the vast and immeasurable suffering of beings in this world. And consider that this Dharma, these teachings, is a remedy, a support. And feel that call, that possibility and opportunity to dedicate ourselves to alleviate that suffering our own and all others. And in the more traditional way, we say not only the beings of this time, but the beings of all time, all space. Just allowing the heart to completely break down any barriers of who our compassion and care is for all beings, all time, all worlds. Notice if there is any sensation in the body, 
many areas of <clears throat> feeling that may become more pronounced with this aspiration. Maybe the sensation of tenderness or yearning. And if the feeling isn't present, no problem. It's just a practice developing this muscle of unbounded compassion. And riding on these beautiful winds of bodhicitta, we move to the first precious pill of, st of stillness in the body. Feel and imagine this body like a mountain, with stability and solidity. feeling the relative stillness of the body, not in movement, but a deeper level of stillness that's also apparent. The natural state of our body. We enter this stillness by engaging with awareness throughout the whole body. Again, if distracted, no problem at all. Just relax and release and return. And continue to deepen the sense of presence with the stillness of the body through a full awareness, as though we were saturating our awareness with being in the body. From the stillness, we can feel and imagine the possibility of that silence of inner speech. Just as with the stillness of the body, there's still subtle movements, undulations of energy. With choosing the inner silence, it's entering the silence by preferencing not the movement of thoughts, but the space between thoughts.
as much as possible, try not to feel frustrated or defeated if silence is elusive. Just keep coming back over and over, finding those gaps, regrounding into the stillness, re-inviting the silence, and fully entering, engaging with these doors, these precious pills. With the body in a natural state of stillness and the speech moving towards its natural state of silence. We invite this warmth and openness in the mind in its natural state. This could feel almost like leaning back in the mind. Experiencing the vastness of awareness, which is beyond any single thought, feeling, or sensation. We can experience this vastness of awareness in front of us, behind us, above us, below us. Maybe noticing just that gentle warmth, our essential nature. Keep leaning back, keep opening, keep leaning back and opening whenever a thought or image, sensation or other distraction arises, find the space that exists all around it.
maybe we notice or catch a glimpse that whatever it is, the sound or the thought, they're temporary, coming and going. That spaciousness and openness is not, it remains no matter what arises. Very gently bringing attention and awareness back to the breath. Once again, riding the breath with our attention through its gentle inhale and exhale. And checking in and noticing the sensations in the body. Maybe they've shifted or changed. Just being curious about how this body feels in this moment. Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> I love how when it gets warmer, there's more jams in the street to help us remind us to practice. <laughs> for friends at home, we had some good sounds going on during meditation. Catchy tune. Catchy tune. Mm -hmm. Any questions, thoughts, reflections? And for folks in the room, please using the mic here. And for friends online, just raising a hand or comment. Yes. I have a question and it's... Uh, bah. <laughs> Two weeks ago when he was speaking, he had a term that he used for our inherent perfection. Mm -hmm. And I have been blanking on that word what am i did he say basic goodness or b intrinsic goodness or did he say buddha nature my interpretation of it was this idea that i'm already perfect yes and just you know that's the essence of soul retrieval yeah is regaining that yes. sense of perfection yeah but what was the word sometimes he uses essential goodness basic no it was a tibetan word oh it was, or a sanskrit word don't know anybody else remember? We'll have to rewatch. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that this is really just so so beautiful and so beneficial is um, when you're agitated and they tell you, "Oh, you should meditate." You know, it's like, well, if I could meditate, then I wouldn't be all agitated. <laughs> But what's helping me 
to move toward the the, the stillness um, when I am agitated is remembering and trying to take it out of my cognition and really into my heart. Mm. It's like, no, you, you are enough. You are okay. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes that can bring me down just enough, mm. but then I can practice. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. It is really a challenging moment when you are frustrated or stressed out in some way or another, or it's the middle of the night. It's really, the mind is so intimidating. <clears throat> it can feel very disempowering to not know how to be with the mind when it's so activated. And if finding that sense of heart and care for yourself, he has a beautiful metaphor. He says that connecting with these inner refuges is like a lost child who finds his mom. And like that kind of warm welcoming back in such a beautiful image that we can experience that. Anybody else questions? Yes, please. Thank you for that practice. I, um, more of a reflection as I was meditating. Um, it's nice when you when you're able to sit in that stillness. At least for me, it's interesting when I'm that still. I can sense the hum of my body. Yeah. And like all the inner workings, I can feel my you know the. the when you're talking about riding the way or riding the breath, it's almost like a envisioning like a surfer, like going up and down the uh, mm. nasal pathway. But then when the music came on, I was like, oh, there's music. And then you said something about spaciousness. Yes. And then for me and the way my mind works, I'm, I'm a science guy. So I was like, there's a the music. And, but it's just, um, it's just my, inner ear memory vibrating it's just sound right it's just the way i think of things and i'm like as so i was imagining the space between mm -hmm. the sound and you know the air molecules which mm -hmm. i must have been thinking too much instead mm -hmm. of meditating but then like hitting my ear and the space between my ear and then the space between my neur neurons so like in my brain mm -hmm. i was like whoa <laughs> Yeah, so there's like a lot of space. Yeah. You know? So I thought that was cool. Beautiful. Thank yeah. Thank you. And I think there's there's an interesting fine line between insight and thinking, you know, and it's a, a tough one to tread. But, you know, on the night of his awakening, the Buddha was thinking, right? He recognized dependent origination that like one single leaf included all the sky and all the clouds and mud and what, right? So there was an insight that allowed the dissipation of his constructed view of the world. And you're describing an insight that helps, you know, kind of penetrate this constructed view of the world as that music's happening to me that, and it's, it's solid. And so seeing those little particles, I mean, I love that. It's a really, it's really interesting. And it can be like, you know, sound is always a good companion. Like you can, there are a couple places in the world you can go to that are quiet. But even if you have the good fortune to end up at Spirit Rock Center, right? There's someone breathing next to you and it can be hella annoying. <laughs> and you're like, oh, and you can make a whole thing about it, right? And so finding that spaciousness, especially with something, I did think it was a good song, but like, let's say <laughs> it was something I didn't like. You can feel the contraction, you know, you can feel the um, desire. You can just work so much with sound. It's, it's not ideal. Like, I'm not saying like, listen to loud music when you practice that that's another practice. I do think though, not very well scientifically proven. I think there will be good studies around sound baths and sound meditation, but it's a little different than finding the stillness of the silence, which doesn't, doesn't mean you have to reject all movement. Like the hum of the body was there. Right. And that that's that paradoxical stillness and movement together. But we can we can like include some of what's happening and like in some ways have our practice move around it because we do live in the world. We don't live in a cave. So, yeah. Other reflections? Yes, Linda. Um, I absolutely did not have the courage to bring this up when we were with Rinpoche. 
but I've been really struggling with this metaphor of the mother and the child mm. and the nurturing. Yeah. I did not have that. And I'm like, every time I'm like, oh, you know, like every time I hear it, I've been meditating with him and like his recordings and hearing that. And every time I'm like, Oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's your practice. Yeah. You know, like that's your teaching. Like, yeah. like you do know love you've been nurtured. You've been loved. Like yeah. you love others like this, but um, I guess I'm just <laughs> The resistance to yeah. that image um, is really strong. It's yeah. really strong. So I'm just trying to sit with that and um, embrace it. Yeah. And a huge desire to have some other metaphor for that. Um, you do or don't? I really do want another one. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, yeah. like, what is the teaching in that? Like, just sit with that discomfort. Like, what else could I bring? Yeah. Um, what else could I bring? And, yeah. 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 Thank you for bringing that. And I do think, you know, it's interesting. There is so much in the traditional um, teachings that's that's very, well, heteronormative, right? And there is kind of also an expectation of, you know, the childhood that was that was okay or good, right? In which there was the loving embrace and holding. And that's not true for everyone. And maybe it was true in the first six months, but then not in the first five years and that, you know, like it, it can be really fraught. And I'd say like the two things that I've heard and, and learned and be curious your thoughts and like working with it. Um, one is, you know, what, whatever is that object. So you were saying I've been loved a lot, you know, and we can all use different forms. And, you know, in my own experience, there's been times with my mom where like that didn't work. The practice didn't work right with her at that time. And, I would bring up another loving figure, right? Whether that's, you know, a teacher, like someone who I felt has been benevolent and and um, supportive of me, like a kind of a Dharma door or someone who's supported my practice. Or yeah, and an individual who loves us, that feeling. So, and a pet is always said, which, you know, for the cat lovers in the room, that can be very true, that kind of unconditioned care. And then the other is like, and this one, I don't know, it's interesting, is to really consider like, you know, it more as an archetype as opposed to an individual experience. So thinking of the love of the mother being like the planet or like the archetypal mother, maybe not in this lifetime, but in other lifetimes. Um, but I think it's not, you know, I don't think it needs to be on you to work it, you know, and I think it's more, like finding, I do think it's interesting to like explore what can be learned from it, but I wouldn't say try to kind of, uh, what's the word, effort for, through, like I'm gonna make this specific metaphor work for me. Like if it doesn't work, you know, then we just let it go. And um, yeah, and it's good for me to hear and remember and keep it in mind. He says it. it's it's very it's like you know it's so archetypal in those teachings you know um, and I'm not saying good or bad but it is yeah and I wonder if he'd be interested in that feedback my guess is not <laughs> but it, it's interesting and I do think you know especially with the loving kindness practice there was a, a some good repair when it was first taught it was always like bring to mind someone you love like your family and very quickly it was like and it's like like your pet or your family or a friend you know like people moved that quickly because i think yeah there's a lot of complication and i think especially in our contemporary modern context where we aren't born and just you know our natural part of our life is going to the monastery or receiving teachings most of us come on the path because things were hard Right. And there was suffering often in our family life or relationships or mental health or substance use. So it makes sense that there's these areas where there's deep wound, but or and that is in some ways, you know, that's the um, as my teacher would say, alchemical fuel for the fire of awakening um, too. And so finding our way to work with those over time is is interesting. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? I'd especially love to hear, like, how was focusing on bodhicitta as a way to get into practice? Could you feel it? 
that are thoughts, images, resistance. I used to think of bodhicitta, bodhicitta, um, you know, the, the benefit of all beings, you know, so let's all get a good night's sleep and let's everybody be able to pay their rent and you know, kind of that this sort of thing. And then I've come to realize it's like, no, it's specifically this awakening mm. and that I want to awaken to assist everyone to awaken. Yeah. Because really, even more excruciating than, um, oh my God, it's almost April 15th and I have to pay my taxes, ah, is actually the, this, it's that state of confusion mm. of not knowing what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. And so when I come back to well, what I'm supposed to be doing is awakening for the benefit of all being, yeah. then once again, that calms me down you know what it feels like it feels like a bit of an insurance policy <laughs> because if that's if that's my my go-to yeah then everything else can't help but fall yeah. into place yeah behind that i love that yeah yeah no you're good no. oh i see oh good ron and serana yes back to back um, I feel like uh, when I practice the um, bodhicitta, um, I feel very gentle and I wasn't really feeling gentle. Mm. Uh, and on the past, sometimes it feels like, like, yeah, compassion never seemed like the bad idea. I feel like it's the best way anytime and every time. Uh, but sometimes it feels like a little bit of ruthlessness is not so bad. Mm -hmm. And yeah. just like, like the Tindin Van Gelderen Bush said, like, okay, this is the identity, just like chop it off. So sometimes I want to tell my ego, just shut up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like you desire this, fuck you. <laughs> you know, that's, sometimes I feel like saying that, um, but for the benefit of, all like maybe dealing with other people maybe compassion is the best way to go but all, every time yeah um yeah well paradoxically i think it's both <laughs> so yeah yeah and you bring up a good point which is you know compassion and bodhicitta are related but not exactly the same you know and compassion yeah. certainly can take the form of fierceness and yeah. towards ourselves and towards others Right. So the compassionate way of being with someone who's harmful isn't just to lay yourself on the floor and let them walk all over you. Right. Yeah. That's the, the doormat compassion. And then so sometimes we do have to set clear boundaries or be fierce or strong. Mm -hmm. And then with bodhicitta, it's like it's it's that's funny. It's like just a little bit like taking that step of compassion one further. Mm -hmm. And there is there is the relative and the ultimate bodhicitta like the relative is our day-to-day -day, like wishing people sleep well or you know wishing people to have a little less suffering and doing the best we can to be enacting our bodhicitta but the ultimate bodhicitta is actually rigpa mm. it's like pure open unconfigured awareness emptiness mm. which is really beautiful that always really it's you know like that our ultimate open part of all beings is an awakened state and purity. Yeah. Thank you. Should be you the Oh, now this this better be good now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, bodhicitta. So sometimes, like um, awakening, seems. Um, I was looking for a word like lofty, mm. right? Um, 
like to think of myself as awakening as uh you know as something that you know there's been times where i've, I've been striving for that and i've been yeah. reading about that and studying it and other times where i'm just I'm like that well that that seems like a lot um but you know it is I, i've come to understand it in a way that that is gentler now in in that um you know i i've I've thought about it and I've read about it and i've I've heard about it as a like an event mm. and and now I'm seeing this process, yeah, that I'm noticing this happening and it's it's you know and the the training that I'm in is you know our our object is is helping people awaken to the present moment mm. and adding that which is you know just adding something that is already there but adding those extra words also seems to soften mm. you know awakening for me as a as a goal to yeah. you know to be there to help people awaken to the the present moment yeah. you know and so i love bodhicitta it's it's my career path <laughs> in the moment. Uh, you don't know? commodify it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I well, know yeah, you I, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, well, um, you know, yeah. Uh, but that, that, uh, that meditation was beautiful. And I did, I wanted to say something I, I, about, um, about something I've noticed before and probably talked about before, but, but, you know, noticing that there's always this swirling motion, you know, in, inside of me, this energy. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like little waves. Sometimes it's like I'm made out of paisleys, right? <laughs> like energetic paisleys, mm -hmm. you know, just things going around. And the stillness, like noticing, it, it's, I notice the stillness only in contrast to all that, that, that motion. Like yeah. it's, it's behind and beneath mm -hmm. it. Yeah, all the time. Even when when I'm noticing that, I'm feeling it, and the and the stillness. I I'm pretty clear that it's always there. Yeah, like it it feels like it's always been there, right? And I'm I'm like, and I have some clarity about that. The other stuff, the energy, also feels like it's always been there, mm -hmm. but I don't know that that's the case. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's beautiful. Yeah, and I do think um, bodhicitta as a career path means that your profession is a bodhisattva. So I'm on board. And, um, and it, you know, that, that energy moving, you know, often upward, often spiraling, right. Which is chronicled in many, uh, wisdom traditions. It's so beautiful. Like that's our essential life energy and it has all these different names and it is, um, not the purpose, but it's blissful. And there's something really nice to recognize. Like, does the Paisley feel pretty good? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, like it's nice to know that there is this inner wellspring of goodness. Um, and to, you know, and again, to, I hear what you're saying about kind of not placing awakening as this, you know, like hashtag, right? Waking up or whatever. Like, it, it can feel really just like, striving or like this achievement or like, I'm going to wake up. And I don't know there, I think maybe our culture especially has um, suffered a little from that feeling like a very self-serving venture when truly like it is absolutely to be of service for all beings. It's, it's not self-optimization and it is the most kind thing we can do. Um, but it is, it is much easier to feel that and recognize it when you continue to keep bodhicitta like really alive. And last year, um, I got to see this teacher who's who's called the Oracle. Um, she is a very close teacher with the Dalai Lama and kind of represents this more mystical um, side of Tibetan Buddhism where there's like prophecy and manifestation. And um, she has this very strong conduit to essentially beings of all time and all these teachings and has this unbelievably um, unique character in the world, whether or not you believe in past life or transmissions, there's something extremely unique. And I was so excited to receive teachings from her. And I, I kind of thought <clears throat> it was going to be like a big show, like there'd be a lot going on and she would be channeling deities and beings. And she spent the whole time like 
Torichita, Torichita, Torichita. Like it's the only thing. Like forget everything else. And it was so pure. It was so pure. Such a beautiful transmission of, you know, all of these unbelievably, you know, uh, sophisticated states of consciousness which she has access to. The most important thing is keeping your dedication clear. So just a beautiful reminder. You still want to? No, you're done? Okay. See, one hand online. <laughs> Hi there. <clears throat> Hi there. Excuse me. I, um, I wanted to mention two things. Um, I love practicing bodhicitta for two main reasons, um, among others, but uh, it always makes me forget even if it's temporarily about some of my own suffering yeah. and um that just makes me feel you know lighter um and i love that feeling even if it is only temporary of being connected through mm. bodhicitta to all beings everywhere I love just resting in that and thinking about that. All the worlds, you even mentioned that during the sit. Um, I just find that such a beautiful meditation. Um, mm. And so thank you for that. Um, and um, the other thing is, I, I clearly I'm working my way through a cold right now. Um, and I've been... I've been thinking about um, Rinpoche's teachings around not identifying with the pain body while mm -hmm. I've been having this cold. And I've been finding it really helpful in not getting bogged down and in, in that, you know, I'm sick, I feel bad, mm -hmm. I feel terrible. More like, you know, my body, I'm not my body. <laughs> Body's having a little trouble you know it really helps me to sort of have that mm. separation from the pain body and now I have that vocabulary and I'm able to sort of work through it like that and I've, I've been finding it very helpful so I wanted mm. to mention that so glad yeah that's that's a beautiful description and I also appreciate the yeah, the essence of bodhicitta allowing you to feel even temporarily connected to all beings. There, is, It's just such a, you know, the mind, needless to say, is so powerful. And we don't necessarily utilize it to its full extent that often. It's really good at getting our daily tasks done, and I'm grateful for that, but that we can use it to imagine these just such vastness, such potential of being of service to all beings. Like, why not? Instead of imagining what we're going to have for dinner, right? <laughs> Just go like, a, you know, and there's such a, you know, there is a, a causal efficacy to it. Like imagining it does create pathways for that kind of behavior to exist and to strengthen and to grow. So, yeah, thanks so for mentioning cool. that. And, yeah. and I think, you know, Rinpoche is, uh, like, I think he was talking about the person who experiences insomnia, and identifying with the insomnia is like, that's who I am. And that creates the extra suffering on top of the pain. And I also think with bodhicitta, people get confused and they're like, you're wishing for alleviation of suffering for all beings in this planet? I'm like, come on, have you seen what's going on? And we actually are wishing to alleviate the pain body is one way to think of it, right? So we can't get rid of all of the sources of pain in this world. And we can, you know, support this ability to be more um, compassionate and clear seeing with the pain and suffering that's here. So that's beautiful. And I also, there's another invitation that you see from a number of traditions. And um, Stephen Levine wrote, you know, this book, A Year to Live. And he recommends whenever you have a cold, imagine you're dying and use it as a process to help you prepare for death. Like you'll never get better. Like, what are you going to do? It's so it's a totally other way. <laughs> yes, yeah. But it's interesting um, practice there, too. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. 
really love, um, yeah, just the variety of reflections and responses. And, you know, it's, it's so essential for us to have Sangha and to be able to hear through the variety of lived experiences of people here together tonight of what are these practices like? You know, where are they challenging? Where are they supporting us? It's, um, yeah, it is a, these, these teachings should be universal and yet they're quite personal. And what we often, I know for me, a lot of what I retain and a lot of what I think about when I practice is often reflections from students or teachers that are just kind of pulled in there. So just thanks for everyone who is sharing. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about space and this kind of safe haven of our inner refuge. Um, let's see here. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's the way that Wangyal Rinpoche sets up these teachings, he's really trying to make them as accessible as possible with like as little ornamentation as possible, just very simple. But then he sprinkles in a little bit more about each of them throughout the book. And he says that, you know, there are these wisdom qualities. So folks more familiar with Tibetan Buddhism know there's a lot written about these wisdom qualities. And we won't go into every single one, but space as a quality, as you know, what we're kind of working with is the wisdom of emptiness and kind of this realization that nothing in and of itself has its inherent existence which is a little different than when we did air a couple of weeks back, which is the wisdom of equanimity and having a st stability as everybody is moving around you. And I don't know about you all, but since we did wind, was it just last week? Maybe it was just last week. And there's, it's been windy. Have you noticed? <laughs> it's been super windy. And just having that uh, sense that wind is playful you know, and practicing with the wind and feeling that playful nature of it. And to practice with spaciousness is, oh, I mean, it's so beautiful. I think it's it's quite natural for us when we think about practicing outside to practice with spaciousness. So I mentioned this before, but living in San Francisco, we're so fortunate. All of the hills, we can get so many vistas at all times. We can see so far out. There's so much sky when we get to the top of these hills. And when the idea is like when we are balanced in our space, when we have that quality of space within us, we feel open, accommodating, expansive, vast, pervasive, flexible, and joyful. And that when we actually have this, you know, lack of space, maybe kind of obviously we feel blocked, lost, lacking openness, and everything seems impenetrable and hard. And what I think is interesting is here he often offers these antidotes or kind of reasons, like why might we be lacking in our, or like what is, what is causing the imbalance of our space? And it's too little urge. So if we're really not able to feel that sense of spaciousness, instead of, it's, I might imagine we'd want to kind of open up even more but the suggestion here is to ground on the earth, to feel the space around us. And I know um, a couple of weeks back when I was working with earth element on the mountain, when I did like literally just put hands on the earth in that classic style of the Buddha, I did feel there was a lot more space around me. I was working with some anger and feelings of frustration and it didn't only feel like they were supported beneath me, they were able to be kind of like held by the spaciousness around. So it's really sweet to see the dynamic interplay of these elements. And, you know, as a reminder, these elements that we're kind of drawing on out there, it's just to use the natural world in a way to remind us of the qualities we share with it and to build that interrelationship, that, that relationality with the natural world. Just, just, I find like, heartbreakingly beautiful, right? That we could be part of the natural world, like it's part of our family, part of our relationship or kin. And so that we can then call upon it like we would call upon a beloved being 
And when we call upon that beloved being and they show up and they're kind and they're warm and they're playful, and we're like, hey, I am too. I like you and I like seeing that in you because I can see it in me. So that's the real kind of the essence of it. And um, so I'll read about uh, his what he describes in your relationship with space. He said, the space element is the openness of the clear, cloudless sky. When the space element is balanced, whatever arises in your life can be accommodated. Even if you're working full time and juggling other responsibilities, there's room for everything. With your vast and accommodating perspective, you never seem to be overwhelmed by experiences or tempted to sidestep responsibilities. Every pleasant experience reflects the presence of openness. Why are you enjoying a nice conversation? Because you're open to that person. Why do you fall in love? Because you're open to a relationship. Why are you able to close an important deal at work? <laughs> Have fun with your children, forgive someone who hurt you. All of it is being open. Even the deepest wounds can be healed when you're open to the healing. Ultimately, openness is the greatest support. Full integration with the space element results in the highest spiritual attainment the recognition of your true nature. And it's really beautiful, like, you know, essentially, especially in the Dzogchen teachings, but in many forms of Buddhism, the ultimate question is, what is the true nature of your mind? And you'll hear this over and over in the text. What is the true nature of your mind? What is the true nature of your mind? And the reason it's asked over and over is so that you're get, you get kind of on this exploratory mission of like, yeah, what is it? Is the true nature of my mind like this busyness? Is the true nature of my mind creativity? Is it you know, like, what is it? And, you know, the suggestion here is, it's this unbelievably beautiful feeling of openness and warmth, right? That is our true nature. And that when we can not just experience the openness, but recognize it as our true nature, that's when things start to shift. So it's one thing to have, like maybe in the meditation, some folks might have had a moment of the kind of spaciousness when we were thinking about the awareness all around us. But to recognize mm, this isn't just somewhere I'm going in meditation. This is the true nature of my mind. <laughs> hard, mm, hard to really like, but that's what we, we just keep working towards like over and over. Um, and then he says, on the other hand, all the discomforts we experience our lack of connection to space. With too little space, every challenge seems solid and impenetrable. When you lose something like a job or significant relationship or a home, you can't focus on anything else. You only focus on what's missing. Space helps us see possibilities. It expands our horizons. So then, you know, he says, take a moment to enjoy spaciousness and reflect on these questions. Are you able to accommodate what's happening in your life? Make decisions and take action with confidence. Um, do you find yourself reacting impulsively or emotionally? And yeah, like just this idea that not just physical space, because of course we'd all like space, meaning we'd all like to have more time in our life to do the things we care about. But that this quality of space, it's almost like having a different set point from which we are experiencing the world. It's, and it is, it doesn't, it's not totally separate from making space, meaning making time. Like it's really different in our day when we're like back to back to back to back to back with things and there's no space. We also feel a lack of inner space. But, you know, most of us live in this crazy city, <laughs> have to work pretty hard and do a lot of things. And yet we can still invite the quality of spaciousness, even with fullness, but, or, and when we start to really crave what spaciousness offers, we're more likely to set up schedules and organize our life in ways that promotes spaciousness. It's coming from both angles, right? We find it and infuse it even within the busyness of our life. And then we're compelled, inspired, motivated to make our life more in accordance with that unbelievably precious feeling <clears throat> like when you really commit to bodhicitta and to even if you don't commit to bodhicitta even if all you want 
is peace of mind, which is a very noble aspiration. You start to really be forced to consider these questions of how do I want to orient my day, my week, my year that will support that spaciousness so peace of mind is possible <clears throat> or support that spaciousness so that we can, yeah. The word accommodate has a funny um, feeling to me. Do you guys have that with accommodate? It sounds like we're like, it doesn't sound very friendly. Like, oh, I'll accommodate that need for you. Like, but what he means is like, it's a, I would say almost like it's a welcoming. You know, the space allows us to welcome whatever arises and do so with grace and do so with generosity. So. Okay, well, we're gonna do just a little space together, uh, a little practice. We started with it, so I think hopefully it'll come back. <clears throat> And so returning this time, hopefully with some familiarity, to finding the stillness in the body. The silence of the inner speech. in the warmth and openness of the mind. the mind feels busy and active, you can give yourself a little release through the exhale, inviting whatever is occupying the mind to release, relax, and ease out with the exhale. But if the mind feels a little dull, tired, you can focus on the inhale, inviting some vividness by that focus. And if it's a little of both, you can find the vividness and the inhale and the ease and relaxation through the exhale.
and gently shifting away from the body and the breath to the mind and imagination. And considering a recent time you've been maybe on the top of the hill or at the shore, somewhere where you can really sense the spaciousness of the sky. And we bring to mind vividly this image of the vastness of sky. And considering these qualities of spaciousness, that that sky can accommodate or hold clouds and rain and sun, stars and moon. And that the sky has so much depth. And that whatever passes through doesn't leave a trace or a mark. The sky can make us feel so much wonder and awe at its openness and vastness. We can see just the ever-changing nature of the world as the sky changes day by day, hour by hour. Yet there's something that always remains the same in that vast openness. Feel or imagine inviting that quality of vast openness. And considering that quality like our own awareness. The eternal and unchanging amid the many movements of the mind and all experiences through our senses. But whatever we are seeing or hearing or smelling or thinking arises and falls and is held in that greater space. You feel and imagine the sky-like nature of mind and awareness. Feel and imagine this body as a body of awareness, openness, vastness. Feel and imagine the heart. It's a heart of vast open space. Maybe there's just a moment or two of residing and resting in spacious awareness. And consider the possibility that we could find this spacious awareness right in the middle of our difficult emotion, our feeling of loneliness, our confusion. Awareness and openness and space is always there even as we're caught in the grip of these experiences. Mm -hmm. 
then if it's comfortable, placing hands together in front of the heart as we move towards dedicating the merit of our practice tonight. And this act of bodhicitta and a desire to share whatever gains and benefits may have been generated through our time together and a symbolic offering that any of our shared time could contribute to this beautiful and outrageous aspiration that each and every being know their true nature, each and every being experience belonging and love, that each and every being could be free. Thank you for your spacious practice. Great to be here.